so I'm going to introduce myself. I think most of you know me, but in case we have some new people, I'm Sophia Yohi. I am the medical director of the Molecular Diagnostics Lab, and I work in both uh, molecular genetic pathology and hematopathology. And I'm going to talk to you today about optical genome mapping in hematologic malignancies. This is going to touch a little bit on a research project that I'm working on. I'm not quite as far along as I had hoped by the time Grand Rounds rolled around. Uh, so we're going to be looking at kind of some of the literature on this as well. The objectives are to explain optical genome mapping technology to make sure everyone kind of understands what it is, assess some of the advantages and limitations of optical genome mapping, and then evaluate its use for hematologic malignancies. Uh, I don't really have any significant financial disclosures. I do have optical genome mapping research project that is funded by the department, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit, uh, but I don't have any interest or stock or anything in the actual technology. What is optical genome mapping? It's a new way to detect structural variants, copy number alterations. It's based on visualizing patterns on long DNA fragments. So the DNA fragments are anywhere from 150,000 base pairs long to 2.5 million base pairs long. And there are um, labels that are put on that then make a pattern that can be assembled into a map. And this is not a sequencing type of technology. Going through the technical steps, there are some important parts. One is that you have to be able to isolate high molecular weight DNA because you need the DNA to be at least 150,000 base pairs long. This takes uh, about six hours to do this sort of specialized um, extraction of high molecular weight DNA. Then there is a labeling, um, direct labeling process where a probe that labels a specific base pair sequence, a six base pair sequence across, across the entire genome is hybridized to the DNA. This process is somewhat labor intensive and essentially takes a full working day to complete. Once that happens, the samples can be transferred to the chips and put into the instrument. This is a two sample chip. We're actually using a three sample chip. It's run on the instrument for about 12 to 18 hours. And then the instrument um, analyzes that data and, and um, converts those images into consensus molecules that are mapped to each other. And then that data is analyzed, which takes another 12 to 24 hours. Now, I do have a star here for this kind of labeling and DNA homogenization, and that's because this is the minimum sort of time, but you have to wait for the DNA to sort of homogenize, and that can take longer in certain instances and can take up to one to three days, which is kind of an important thing to consider if thinking about using this for clinical purposes in terms of your workflow and turnaround times. The data is processed really two different ways. So one, the consensus reads are aligned and mapped to the reference, and then it is analyzed for breaks or patterns compared to that reference. In addition, the aligned reads are counted. Um, and this counting is used like a lot of other methodologies for detecting copy number variations, but the consensus map and the comparison of the signals allows you to detect not only those copy number variations, but insertions, deletions, repeat expansions, and rearrangements. There are some limitations to how big a change has to be to be detected by the sequencing, and that limit is somewhat dependent on the application and how many of the, the cells of interest are around. So for germline applications, able to detect mosaics down to about a 20% variant allele fraction, you can get indels down to about 500 bases. Same for trinucleotide repeats, which is gonna be you know, uh, around 200 copies or so. And you can get 30 to 50 KB inversions and translocations. For somatic applications, where you have about 10% of cells of interest for a 5% variant allele fraction, it's a tenfold higher or lower resolution, really. Um, so you can detect indels down to 5,000 bases or 5 kilobases. 
there are a lot of quality parameters that need to be looked at for the data. Some of this is what is the length of the DNA molecules? Is your sample got, does it have long enough DNA molecules? <clears throat> so there's a weighted average of that length. There's a mapping rate. So how well the consensus molecules align to the reference. There's data about the actual labels themselves. How frequent are the labels? Are there labels missing? Are there extra labels? The effective coverage, so how many um, molecules of DNA you have that cover a generic uh, genomic area. And then just an estimate of background noise for how well the aligned molecules actually align to that reference. So just talking about the technical, there are already some important limitations that I want to make sure people are aware of. One is that this needs long DNA fragments, which means that you need fresh. Manufacturer recommends about 72 hours. Some of the literature has looked at a little bit longer, maybe up to 96 hours. Flash frozen or stabilized frozen samples, which is actually what we've used for this study. It can't be used for FFPE, which means that its application for solid tumors is going to be more limited. And the sample handling is really important, and it requires a special DNA extraction. One of the other important limitations is that it's unable to reliably detect copy neutral loss of heterozygosity. If you have a really, really large area of copy number loss of heterozygosity, you may have high homozygous calls of indels, and this may give you a clue, but it is not reliable and it's not going to detect smaller uh, areas of copy neutral loss of heterozygosity like a SNP array would. So, as I said, the need for fresh tissue really limits the application for solid tumors, but it's amenable to germline and hematologic malignancies, and I do heme, so of course I was thinking, what can I do with this? And I'll just let you know I have a few pictures scattered throughout here that um, is what you get if you Google my evil plan. You get a bunch of little animal pictures <laughs> that look like they're plotting, um, so they're, they're scattered throughout here, and you'll see those. So to think about this, my first, my, I first wanted to see, well, what's been done and then where are the gaps? And so when I was first starting this back in 2021, there hadn't been a whole lot of data out there on optical genome mapping. If you do kind of a, group, uh, a PubMed search, you can see that the literature really started in 2021. It's increased here in 2022. So there weren't that many papers in 2021. And a lot of them were case reports, et cetera. So there were three main papers that talked about the utility of optical genome mapping compared to other technologies. One was a germline paper and two of them were heme papers. There was also a paper on non-invasive prenatal testing, but that's significantly different enough that I, I didn't focus on that. So the germline paper looked at 85 patients with about 92 constitutional structural variants that were detected by karyotype fish or array. And all of these alterations were detected, but they required some adjustment of filtering the data. And we'll talk a little bit later about filtering because this is a very important process as we discovered when we started looking at our data. Um, only six of these cases had array, so it wasn't a lot to look at, but they said it supported a low false positive and negative rate for copy number variation. The study by Lestringent was looking at ALL cases, a fairly limited number, only 10 of them, but there were many structural variants within these 10 cases, about 80 of them, two of which were copy neutral loss of heterozygosity, which we would not expect to pick up. So they did not include the copy neutral loss of heterozygosity in their, in their um, data. They got about a 90% detection by optical genome mapping. They were able to rescue eight of the misses um, with filtering, but there were still four that they were not able to detect. Two of them occurred in the pseudo-autosomal region of the X chromosome. One was a microdeletion, and then one was a subclonal gain that was seen only by karyotype, but not by array or optical genome mapping. So this is something that's kind of below the limit of detection. In addition, they had 16 things that they called new calls. 
they determined that four of these were noise. Seven of these were actually confirmed that these were calls that were present, that when they went back and looked, they could confirm them. Two more were sort of complex um, changes that were supported by the karyotype. Um, and future studies have really referred to this more of, as being able to refine or resolve the karyotype and not necessarily a new call per se. And then they had an additional three that they really couldn't uh, come up with a way to try and confirm. Them. And then the last paper from 2021 is from Neveling et al. This looked at 52 cases of hematologic malignancies, kind of a smattering. You can see that there's some myeloid cases, some lymphoid cases. About half of the lymphoid cases are CLL. The other half are some other things. There was like one plasma cell neoplasm. And then most of the myeloid neoplasms were MDS and AML. They divided these cases up into simple cases and complex cases. For the simple cases, there was 100% concordance, but only 14 of 16 complex cases were concordant. And four of these required changes to the filter settings to actually detect and become concordance. However, much of their misses were due to a low percentage, so around 10-ish percent. I told you that the limit of detection is 5%, so this is still a little bit higher than that, but it's still on the lower end of that limit of detection. They did note that optical genome mapping re resolved some issues on karyotype that were unclear, and they gave some of the sensitivities and specificities compared to the standard of care. And you can see that the um, sensitivity and specificity compared to fish was pretty good. It wasn't quite um, as good for karyotype with an 82% positive predictive value and a little bit lower for array. Again, this may also include some copy neutral loss of heterozygosity calls. So at this time, I was thinking, well, where are the gaps based on this data and based on when might optical genome mapping have an advantage over traditional techniques that we already use, like FISH, karyotype, and array? So plasma cell myeloma is one of the things I thought about. Plasma cells don't usually grow, and so G-banding karyotype usually doesn't work. We do a FISH panel, um, which detects the common uh, alterations that we know of that have prognostic significance, but optical genome mapping might allow a more thorough characterization, including some cryptic changes. Now, plasma cells can be sparse on aspirates, so that 10% tumor cell might be a problem, but we can and we do sort currently for fish panels, so it's certainly possible that that similar approach can be done with optical genome mapping. Next, I thought about non-Hodgkin lymphoma, mostly B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma. We typically do lymphoma workups when patients are suspected to have a lymphoma, but a lot of times there's not enough tissue to send for a karyotype, and so we send for morphology and we send for flow. If we need genetic testing, we typically order fish to confirm some rearrangements, but we don't have availability of fish probes for some of the rarer genetic alterations. And so we're kind of limited as to what we can, what we can get or what we might need to send out for something rare. Optical genome mapping requires less tissue than for karyotype because you don't need to grow the cells and you can use a similar amount to what we get from flow. And actually this study that I'm doing is designed to be done on residual flow samples. So you could even use residual flow samples to get this information. And so I thought that this could be done in a lymphoma workup. You could send a piece for flow, a piece for optical genome mapping, or if you didn't send optical genome mapping, you could use residual flow specimen if needed. And lastly, I thought about myeloid neoplasms, and karyotype in fish is pretty informative for these and is, I think, a good standard of care. There is sometimes urgency to get results, and I wondered if optical genome mapping, mapping might have some benefit for that because you don't have to wait for the cells to grow. Um, and so if optical genome mapping were equivalent, but it could be done more quickly, it might be useful. It also might detect some of the cryptic changes that we know um, can't be detected by karyotype and we have to do separate fish. And so could you maybe get it with using fewer um, platforms to get the, the same answer? 
So my study was designed to look at residual flow samples in 120 cases. And I wanted to get about an even mix of plasma cell myelomas, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and myeloid neoplasms and compare them to standard of care. There are some additional considerations uh, based on the literature. It's very likely that there will be some extra or new findings and, you know, will we be able to validate a subset of those? And when we aliquoted some of our samples, we got multiple aliquots in case we needed to repeat, but also for the possibility of comparing with some of the sequencing techniques that can be used for copy number variation and structural variation detection. So where are we now? So we received and set up the instrument. We had training um, in September and October, and we've collected um, pretty much all of the non-Hodgkin lymphoma samples. We just need a couple more. The plasma cell neoplasms were a little bit um, behind on. This is, I think, because we're looking for plasma cell neoplasm cases in flow that have at least 10% plasma cells, which is somewhat problematic. Um, so I think I may pursue looking into whether or not we can get some sorted samples. And then clonal myeloid neoplasms, we have quite a few AMLs. We have fewer myeloproliferative neoplasms in MDS. And I think that's because when I spoke to my hemopath colleagues about needing 10% neoplastic cells in MPN and MDS, you can't really tell how many neoplastic cells there are. So I think we're going to catch up on those other cases soon. So we've successfully run six samples. I was hoping to be able to go through all six of those samples with you guys today, but there have been analysis issues for the last three that we did. We've been trying to get those to run since last week. We're working with the vendor and they ran them separately, but it still wasn't there as of yesterday afternoon. So I don't have that information. So I do have the three cases that the analysis has been complete and we've been going through that data. We have additional samples that have been extracted and that are ready to be run. And that's kind of where we're at right now. So I wanted to go a little bit into our analyzed cases and sort of what we learned from our first three cases. We chose these cases because they had a wide range of percentage of neoplastic cells, one sample kind of near the limit um, at 14%, and then a couple of cases that had higher, and a, a variety of diagnoses. So the first one is a acute leukemia that was somewhat ambiguous, whether or not it was B lymphoblastic leukemia or whether it was um, a mixed phenotype B myeloid leukemia. We have a CLL case and then a straightforward AML case. The data that comes out has multiple ways to be viewed, and I'm going to show some of these different views on subsequent slides as we look at the data. So I just want you to be familiar that there's a circos plot, something called a genome browser view, a whole genome view, an ideogram, and then a curated variant list, which has all the variants that were called, and then a classifier uh, view where you can kind of look into more detail at a specific variant. So the circos plot is generally where you start and you get something that looks like this. It has a, um, a cytoband track that shows the banding pattern of the chromosomes, the uh, insertions, deletions, inversions, duplications. So some of the data that is determined from that consensus mapping and comparing the patterns. And then you have the copy number track here, which is more from that counting of the reads. And then you have the translocations, either interchromosome or in intrachromosome or interchromosome translocations. So some of our early lessons were that filtering is critical. So some of the filtered things, you need to filter out mast regions. Mast regions are areas that are very noisy because they're either difficult to map or they're similar to other areas. So one example of this is the centromeres. So you can't really detect something right around the centromeres. This also will filter out areas that have common artifacts. 
It's also important to filter out normal findings. Now, hopefully this definition will increase over time. Right now, normal is based on something that's found in 57 controls that were run by the manufacturer. And as we know from a lot of other genetic databases, 57 controls is not a very big number for defining what kind of normal population um, changes are. You also can filter based on quality metrics, both confidence scores and molecular counts, as well as the size of the copy number alteration. And that's important for if you're doing germline versus uh, somatic testing, you have to have a different cutoff for what you're gonna call. So here's an example of what things look like pre and post filtering. So you can see that we've lost a few of these translocations, but what we've really lost is a lot of these um, insertions and deletions. You can see there's many, many fewer of these here. And there's a, a newer paper that looked at 59 samples that actually published their pre-filter and post-filter um, total structural variations. And they had 86,000 over these 59 samples before filtering. And it was down to a little over 4,000 post-filtering. So again, post-filtering is really important. Although I will notate that they uh, commented that they still had on average 71 calls per sample, which is still a lot to go through for a particular sample. So now let's talk about our actual cases. So the first case was that acute leukemia that was somewhat ambiguous. This had a karyotype that showed a trisomy 12 in a small number of metaphases, about 10% of metaphases. Unfortunately, optical genome mapping was negative in this case. It's not surprising. The literature that is out there suggests that when we're getting to the lower limit of detection, we may not pick things up. And so this is not totally unexpected. This 10% is also for metaphases, so it may be even lower than that in the actual um, total cell population. So this is likely a subclonal false negative um, based on limit of detection. The next case was CLL, and there's a clinical note saying that fish is being ordered, but we don't seem to have results yet, so that is still pending. And for this, we detected a deletion in chromosome 13, Q14.2 to Q14.3. Here are the genomic coordinates for that. And then I'll talk about this AML case in more detail because it had a complex karyotype and working through optical genome mapping results is also fairly complex. So first I wanna show you the CLL case. So this is a much simpler circos plot than the last one I showed you, which is actually that AML case. And if you look at the variant list, there were several variants, but most of these are benign when you look them up in databases um, for copy number variation. But the one that's pathogenic here is this one that I told you about, it's a one megabase deletion. This is the variant classifier view where you can really focus in on a specific variant. And you can see here that the, the read shows this part of the reference adjacent to this part of the reference, meaning that the part in between has been deleted. And this location of a deletion is very common in CLL. It involves a couple of microRNAs, 16-1 and 15A. And so I think even though we don't have fish uh, yet to confirm this, that this is likely a, a real call and it makes sense for the diagnosis. So next I'm going to talk about the AML case. So this case had a complex karyotype. It had multiple different clones. And, but you can see that there is at least some overlap with what we're seeing by karyotype. So deletions in chromosome one P, the short arm of chromosome one, the long arm of chromosome five, and the long arm of chromosome 11. You can see those findings that are here. We also have some abnormalities in the long arm of chromosome four, consistent with this deletion. We'll talk about this additional material when we look at the next view because there are also multiple uh, translocations in this region. There is some addition, some abnormalities in the short arm of chromosome 12 here that it likely 
represents this cytogenetic abnormality with additional material on the short arm of chromosome 12 along with a deletion. We don't see a whole loss of chromosome 13. We only see a partial loss by optical genome mapping. And the other things that we don't really see, though, are abnormalities in chromosome 9, a duplication, and uh, chromosome 16. So we'll go through some of these things. So very complex optical genome mapping study. So I've not gone through the entire process yet. So one of the things I want to draw your attention to here is the short arm of chromosome 12 and this long arm of chromosome 4, which have multiple abnormalities. I'm going to orient you to this ideogram view. It has the copy number changes over here. This is based on the read depth and counting. And you can see gains alternating with losses and gains and loss, gain and loss. And then you can see multiple uh, copy number changes that correspond to that based on the matching and comparison to the reference, and then multiple translocations, some of which are uh, fusions within the chromosome. And most of the ones that go to another chromosome go over here to the long arm of chromosome four, one of which involves ETB6. And I will say that FISH was done to assess ETV6 in this case, and there was a suggestion of a rearrangement of ETV6 with the, which the optical genome mapping supports. <clears throat> and so I think that this is probably representative of this additional material on chromosome 12 with the deletion of part of chromosome 12. Next is the long arm of chromosome four. You can see that there are multiple areas that are deleted and there's a, a small area that is has a gain and there are multiple translocations as well. Many of these are actually to other chromosomes. So most of them go to chromosome 12, but one does go to chromosome nine. And I don't know if that might be responsible for the karyotypic appearance of this dupe nine uh, or, or not. So looking at this short arm of chromosome 12 and the long arm of chromosome four, you can see that there's a lot of genetic abnormalities in this focal region. And then the rest of the chromosome is relatively spared. So this made me think about the complex genetic alterations that, that we can see. Um, and I immediately thought about chromothripsis. And when I was researching for this talk, I discovered that there are some other types of complex genetic alterations that have also been described, including chromanosynthesis and chromoplexy. And there's a term chrome anagenesis that refers to all catastrophic events that produce complex chromosomal rearrangements. And um, these are the types that are usually defined underneath there. So I know that we've talked about chromothripsis. I think in other grand rounds, people have brought up chromothripsis. So this will be hopefully a refresher. But chromothripsis is when there are multiple rearrangements in localized regions on one to several chromosomes. You get clustered DNA breaks with multiple different DNA breaks in close proximity to each other, surrounded by large regions of DNA that's not effective. The fragments are combined in random order and have a random orientation, and some may be deleted. And there is also an ISCN definition of complex patterns of alternating gene copy number changes from normal to gain to loss along the length of a chromosome or chromosomal segment. And I think that the findings in the short arm of chromosome 12 certainly meet this definition and perhaps the long arm of chromosome 4 as well. It's a little unclear to me the specific difference between chromothripsis and chromanosynthesis. Some Definitions say that this is rearrangement loss and the gain, duplication and triplication of fragments is part of what differentiates this from chrom chromothripsis, but chromothripsis can have gains. So um, I think that the thought is that this has a different mechanism of action. So chromothripsis is thought to be a catastrophic genetic event where the chromosome is shattered, whereas chromanosynthesis is thought to 
at least, at least in some cases, be more of a disorder of replication where you get sequential replication fork stalling, and then the replication starts somewhere else or on the other allele. The last one is chromoplexy, and this is having multiple interchromosomal rearrangements, but actually very little loss of um, or gain of chromosomal material. So you don't have the copy number changes, just the rearrangements between chromosomes. This has been described in prostate cancer uh, was one of the things that I saw. So again, I, I wonder about the possibility of a chromothripsis type event or one of these complex genetic abnormalities in some of these, these areas, these focal areas. That also brings to me, how do you report this complex structural variant? If you look at that short arm of chromosome 12, you've got multiple deletions, you've got duplications that range from three to four copies, you've got various translocations. Do we list everything, which could get to hundreds of variants potentially? Do we prioritize and just list things that we think have a significant effect? Do we give a synopsis that there's a complex chromothriptic event on chromosome 12P that includes this and has, for example, an ETV6 rearrangement? Which variants, if any, should be combined? So if you look here on the long arm of chromosome 4, there's a couple of deletions here that to me look like, I'm not sure why you would just call that one deletion and wouldn't just or why you would call it two separate deletions and not one. There's a couple things like that um, that we'll be sorting out as we look through this data. Should we be combining these into one call? Should we keep them as two separate calls? And then because we have genomic coordinates for most of these, should we be using HGVS nomenclature, which uses the genomic coordinates, or should we use the ISCN nomenclature, which uses the banding patterns? The software for this gives you both coordinates, so technically you can use both, and that would be another question is should you use both? Uh, I've seen kind of um, both often used in the literature, but thinking about how you might report this clinically, I think um, both might be somewhat confusing. So again, I'd hope to have more cases to go through with you and, and to talk about, but to round out the talk, I'm going to look at some of the newer things that have come out in optical genome mapping in hematologic malignancies. And these are relatively new, uh, coming out in the most recent, or the longest ago was in September, actually. So optical genome mapping has been looked at in MDS. When they compared to standard of care, which just included karyotype, fish only when needed, these cases also got an NGS gene panel. Optical genome mapping picked up a structural variation variant in more cases than karyotype did. And some of the changes that were not seen by karyotype that were seen by optical genome mapping included smaller segmental deletions in chromosomes 5 and 7, deletions and rearrangements of TP53, and deletion, amplification, and partial tandem duplication of KMT2A. When they looked at the risk stratification and they calculated a cytogenetic and then used that for the revised international prognostic scoring system, it changed the patient's classification in 17% of patients. And when they looked at outcomes in this group of about 100 patients, there was a trend towards improved risk stratification using the optical genome mapping data, but it wasn't statistically significant, and that's because they're probably going to need a lot more cases to determine whether there's actually a statistically significant difference between those. Then there are some of the papers that are in press, and there's this paper, which is fairly similar to what we are planning to do. They aren't doing quite as many samples as we are. They're, they did 59 hematologic malignancies. You can see that it's a variety of cases. This is a publication of a clinical validation. It's in press, but not yet in print. Um, this is the one that talked about the number of structural variations, both pre and post filter. And again, they still had a large number of things to go through. They determined a pretty high um, 
concordance, about 99%, where it detected 162 of the 164 standard of care calls. And the two that were missed were below that 10% cutoff, so kind of getting near that limit of detection. And again, karyotype may not directly correlate with what you're seeing in a um, another type of sample that doesn't have the cells being grown. So it missed one aneuploidy and one insertion that was detected by karyotype. It was able to resolve some marker chromosomes. The study also looked at some normal controls. There was another study done looking just at AML cases. So this is similar to MDS, about 100 cases. This is a multi-center study to get these 100 cases. And this was compared, again, to routine care. So that could vary. It was sometimes karyotype. Sometimes it was karyotype in fish. Sometimes it was karyotype in array. And <clears throat> if they limited it to things that could be detected that were 5% or greater, they got about a 98% concordance with karyotype. And they missed one call that was more at 10%, but again, that's metaphases and may not exactly correlate. They also detected new information in 13%. So in 4% of the patients, that would have altered the recommended care, what they determined or what they found by optical genome mapping. And in 8% of patients, they would have been eligible for a clinical trial based on the additional information. There have also been some case report, some more case reports in hematologic malignancies, including looking at myeloid and lymphoid neoplasms with the eosinophilia and tyrosine kinase gene fusions. They were able to identify PDGFRB rearrangements and the partner genes, which are uncommon partner genes and don't have um, may not have specific fish probes all the time. So looking through kind of what we've worked on and what's in the literature. I think some of the questions that need to be considered for clinical implementation is when should optical genome mapping be used in addition to or in place of another methodology? You know, <clears throat> it, it doesn't pick up everything. And so like a lot of our other strategies, I think we're going to have to decide when do we need to use optical genome mapping as a primary method? What else do we need to do to support it um, to make sure we're not missing things? Um, when is it used as a supplementary method? What is the best reporting strategy? And this is for multiple things. So how do we report all these multiple calls. You know, for karyotype, we generally report everything we detect. For arrays, for NGS, we typically report things that we think are significant or pathogenic. Um, what strategy should be used? How do we report complex variants? There's some guidance out there, but I think that we are going to be um, detecting complexity at a little bit different level than we have previously. And should we be using ISCN nomenclature, HGBS nomenclature, or both. I'm not sure in retrospect, now that we've been running some of these samples, that there's a definitive time advantage over the other methodologies that are in play currently. And the throughput is relatively low for the instruments. Currently, we can only run three on the instrument at a time. The The technical portion is quite labor intensive and you can't do large numbers of samples at one time because of the hands-on portions have to be done within a certain amount of time. And so these are all things that I think will affect how this is used both in a research setting but also in a clinical setting. So in summary, optical genome mapping is a new method to detect structural variation. It's got pretty decent detection of structural variants compared to standard of care in hematologic malignancies as well as germline. Many of the studies have shown it detecting additional findings um, compared to the standard of care. And most of the misses is when the finding is at the lower limit of detection and is being picked up on karyotype. 
It also does not detect copy neutral loss of heterozygosity. So if that is an important thing, then this is not going to be the best technique. One of the limitations is the need for fresher frozen tissue. This will affect when we can apply this. Um, it's not going to be useful for most solid tumor testing unless workflows significantly change to send uh, fresh or frozen tissue. Most solid tumor testing goes directly into formalin, and this technique does not work with that. And then I think with time, we're going to need refinement of our data analysis, our filtering, our reporting standards, as well as determining when this use of this technology is optimal compared to using the other technologies that are in our armamentarium. So I would like to give some thanks to the team. So Sid is helping me with this. We have a resident, Megan, and Vinu and Kyleen in the lab are helping with some of the technical technical parts as well. I'd like to thank the HEME faculty who have generously been sending cases to us when they're on flow and have a positive case. I'd like to thank Dr. Furk for his financial support and for Carolyn Hallstrom for helping get everything, including the instruments set up and helping with ordering and everything. Um, I'm happy to take questions at this time and here are my references. Sophia? Yeah. Hi, this is Betsy. Hey, Betsy. Um, <laughs> hi. Thank you for that very nice um, review. I, um, I have a couple of questions and then maybe a comment or two. Sure, yeah. The, um, one is that the American College of Medical Genetics did put out guidelines for reporting array data, which is essentially the component that you showed for the BioNano here. So. Yes. It is by coordinate and also it's evidence-based. Um, so that might be a really nice reference. Um, it also describes, and I totally agree with you, it's confusing very, very often to determine between chromothripsis and chromoanensynthesis, but it has to do with how many times you go back and forth within a 10 megabase region and whether you have just one change uh, in copy number, or whether you um, have more than that, but it still is a tough, <laughs> a tough, tough distinction. Yep. And I think we are finding recurrent chromothripsis with specifically with certain regions where there are these critical genes. So ETB6 being one and KMT2A being another and some other regions in 5Q. I think the question I have is that, um, so if you, look at that particular case, the data that you presented were the array-based data, the copy number. Um, but what I think is really such a great thing about BioNano is the ability to actually see the fusions and the rearrangements. So if we called um, clinically, this case is obviously recognizable to us because it's so unique. Um, he was, I think, 80 years old at, the physicians were not interested in doing anything clinically uh, to further like even an array. But did you have the opportunity to run the, the other part of the bio nano to see that data, to see whether or not you had critical gene fusions? Because yep. even when we go through the array data, array data and we're looking at the breakpoints, we would be looking at whether or not they created a fusion that was significant, but you would have the advantage in BioNano of having seen in the surface diagram those rearrangements between within a chromosome or between. So I was just wondering about that. Yeah. So so we have. And the the problem is I haven't fully gone through all of that data yet because there are actually so many translocations. I can go back to the surface plot for this case, and there are actually a lot <laughs> of translocations to work through. We do know that one of these 412s does involve ETB6. I can't remember what the partner is off the top of my head, Sid, I don't know if you remember, but one of them does involve the ETB6 gene. And so there are multiple rearrangements. And actually on this view, all of these pink bars are a rearrangement either within the chromosome or between another chromosome. And so it, 
I, I initially had a bunch of arrows drawn showing where these went. When you're actually using the software, you can hover over it and it will show you where it goes to, but I can't do that in real time. And when I started drawing arrows on it, it just, it was really hard to draw the arrows and make the, the picture like visible. So, um, so you can do that. And, and so far the main rearrangement that we've gone through and determined is significant is the ETV six, but we've not finished analyzing this case yet in terms of looking at the significance of all of these calls because there are so many calls there's like there's like a hundred what was it? 123 calls i think um to go through so um so i started with kind of these these large areas and have been working through that but i have not we've not finished completely going through that data. So I agree with you, the translocations are important and there are multiple translocations in those areas as well. They're, they're identified by these pink bars. Unfortunately, the pink is both intrachromosomal as well as interchromosomal. So some of these are within the chromosome. Um, so probably some internal, some duplications like in, in, uh, sequential duplications, but also some of them are translocations between other chromosomes. So I'm sorry if that wasn't clear when I went through it. Hey, Sophia, this is Scott. That was great. I really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. I have a couple of uh, technical questions. Yeah. So what's the success rate with obtaining the ultra high molecular weight genomic DNA from, from your specimens? Are you guys batting a thousand or do some of them fail at that stage? Yeah. yeah. So we're not batting a thousand, but I, I will tell you that we are not using fresh specimens. So what we are doing is we are taking residual flow samples. We are using the count from flow cytometry and we are freezing aliquots with a stabilizing buffer. And so just recently we had a couple samples that were extracted that, um, so as you go through the extraction process, because of the large fragments of DNA, you have a very viscous sample. And so a couple of the samples recently were not viscous and, and didn't give us any DNA. And we're trying to troubleshoot what that was. You know, it's hard for me to say because we're still pretty new at this. <laughs> it's it's a very technical, hands-on, and it's fairly, I don't know, it's persnickety. <laughs> Sid can maybe answer he's done some of the hands-on, but it, it's got some fairly persnickety steps that you have to go through. And so, you know, at kind of this early stage is the, would the rate be better when we're a little more experienced doing it um and, and that i don't know so we are troubleshooting that so you know i guess for us right now that's two out of i don't know 10 or so so it that's fairly high but again this is sort of like the first one of the first runs solo too so it, well, and that, and that sounds pretty reasonable. We've actually been sending tissue specimens to bionanogenomics to do to do everything for us start to finish. And we've had to send and resend several of our specimens because of failures in their shop. So I would imagine your experience is probably on par with the, you know, the creators of the technology. And that leads to my my second question is what what are your per sample costs looking like doing this in house from start to finish? We found it pretty easy to just send tissue and get data back. Uh, yeah, that that's fair. Um, I think so for a research setting that that's probably the costs are not hugely different. I, I believe we are getting um, the kits for about four fifty. It's. 450 or 550 per sample, and it depends on how many kits you buy, basically. And I think if you send it in, it's it's in that range as well. Um, I think the 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 so optical genome mapping is being used by a lot of clinical labs for um, you know for as part of their cytogenomic process, basically. And so that was part of the reason that. I was interested to actually see how it worked more hands-on rather than just sending it out and getting results back. So, 
Um, but yeah, that, that's certainly another option. And I don't think the cost difference is that much, but I, I'm based on talking with them, but I'm not sure. No, that's really helpful. Thank you. And then, and then the instrument that you're using, is that for clinical purposes only, or could research specimens be put through this pipeline? Uh, we're actually just using it for research right now. So it is for research use right now. Um, and But I don't know if we'll be keeping the instrument right now. We're doing kind of a, a rental period. And so right. there'll be discussions on whether or not to purchase the instrument at the end of the, the time period. But, but no, research could certainly be done on it um, in coordination. There'd just be a question of, you know, who's doing the the hands-on part. So um I'll yeah. connect with you offline. This is really helpful. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Sophia Leo here. Thanks for the great talk. Actually pertaining to the last thing, I would ask any of the faculty or others who are on this uh, this nice uh, grand rounds to um, send a message to Sophia if you see uh, that you may have interest in using this technology in the future because that may help us <clears throat> guide a decision on whether we might purchase this um, instrument you know even if it's just for research uh, and people want to use it uh, I think that's terrific the uh, question I have for you, Sophia, a lot of these, you know, as we've seen throughout our careers, you know, you get these early generation technologies or instrumentation and they, they get you so far and they're, you know, there's, there's gaps, there's issues, there's things, but, you know, you, you get better and better and better. Over yeah. Time. yeah. And so I think, you know, I think the jury's still out on the, the utility uh, clinically and whatever, this is my estimation. And, I wonder um, if you could speculate on whether some of the uh, labor intensive hands on stuff that's necessary here. Do you see any aspects of that being able to be automated uh, in the future that also could change the perspective of the clinical utility? I do. And I think the throughputs already improving as well. So, you know, there are, there's some differences. I've already seen a little bit of migration of that throughput. And I do think that with time, they will, they will make that hands-on portion easier or potentially automated. Um, so I, I do think that some of that is possible. I still think there are some steps that might require a delicate hand um you know um filling the chips is actually very very to be very careful filling those chips which is similar to a lot of the other instruments we use you know the ngs instruments and other things filling those the fluidime the you know microfluidics filling the chips is very important how you do that and you have to be very you have to have a very steady hand. <laughs> this is the bottom line. So, so uh, if I may, if I may add, when I was training with the BioNano team, I had the same question. Like, and they said they were working on reducing some of the labor intensive. They had already reduced the uh, labeling period. Like that was even longer than what it is right now. Uh, what uh, what I got is that. Other than the like the it's a lot easier for them to reduce the labeling time and but the DNA extraction process that is really, really difficult to uh you know shorten. But that's that's the most critical element in the entire entire process. Yeah. Sophia, hi Tony. I really interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, sort of related to that, I mean the other aspect of this part of the technical improvements that might, might be necessary is the reading and, and the data analysis and yeah. what is being done on you know in that on that front to kind of speed things up so you don't have to go searching databases manually and, and so forth yeah so you know that is that, my... that is still all over the place actually uh, <laughs> i was recently at amp where they had half a day uh, dedicated to optical genome mapping and I personally went and chatted with Dr. Adams in, I think from the University of Toronto where they're actually taking this up in a big way. And they, they were actually planning to replace a lot of standard cytogenetic testing with optical genome mapping. And I, and I spoke to him and I asked him, you know, there's nothing standardized yet. 
like there's no database, <clears throat> there's no standardization of the filters which we are figuring out. And he said that there is a working group which we should be able to join in January, which is a group of different people uh, doing this using this technology, and they are planning to publish a big paper in January where they will have uh, you know guidelines and standards, at least initial, for how you know how this technology can be taken forward and how uh, you know, what databases to use and how the data can be further analyzed. So as of yet, there is no standard, and everyone's been using their own guidelines and. You know, a lot of the studies still have been retrospective and they have been correlating with fish and cytogenetics. So it's still a work in progress. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I think it's similar to the early days of NGS where people are figuring it out. They're doing the best they can with what they've got and it'll improve over time, right? And it'll become, you know, we'll, we'll get more specific data around this will it, the the data analyzing the data will become easier over time right it ngs data has become easier to view over time i assume array went through the same thing betsy could probably speak to that because she was involved with that but um you know they make improvements over time so sophia i was okay Sorry, uh, Sophia, I have a, just Bharat here, I have a question. Yeah. I was wondering, you know, uh, if you use these uh, DNA extraction methods that give you high molecular weight DNA, has there been a comparison of, you know, optical genome mapping versus just long read sequencing for detection of these structural variants? Is there... Not uh, that I've seen. Not that I've seen Bharat, but I'm hoping that that's phase two for this study. <laughs> but I got to get okay. through phase one first. <laughs> All right. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. I'm, I'm hoping that we'll be able to at least take a subset of these and do some, you know, some of the other, because there are several NGS technologies that are aimed towards trying to get at structural variants. Long read is one of them, but there are others as well. And I'd be curious to do that comparison. I don't think there's a comparison out there that I've seen. Um, I don't know. Okay, Sid hasn't either. So uh, that is one of the things that I'd like to do because I, I agree with you. It'll be interesting to see um, how those compare. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so one of the great things with the DNA extraction is that it after it can be stored at room temperature. So I think that would solve a lot of issues. Like if you suddenly need DNA, freeze thawing would you know change a few things. It would damage the DNA. So that thing's out of that thing's taken away if it's stored at room temperature. So that's 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 a big advantage of uh, getting their uh, high molecular weight DNA. Yeah, Jack, it looks Love like. Yeah, so I, I was just about to say, you know, I don't think any of these long read sequences can sequence past 150 KB anyways. Um, so I'm not sure we need this um, high this molecular DNA. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, we we have also saved multiple aliquots for some specimens, and partially that was because we might need to repeat samples, but also, um, you know, I, there was a thought I did actually write the IRB to do some NGS comparisons. So, um, but like I said, that is kind of, we're focusing on this part first. So we do have separate aliquots also, so we could do a more traditional DNA extraction for, for many of the samples. Bartek? Yeah. Um, yeah, very interesting talk. Uh, thank you, Sophia. So, uh, Thinking of uh, uh, areas where it could improve, uh, what do you think about potential application of this in follow-up, in, in, in looking for residual disease? Obviously, the limit of detection will be a problem. Do you think this is something that can be ever improved? So I think the limit of detection is definitely a problem, and I don't know how easily that can be improved. I mean... Um, and, you know, you could sort potentially and do follow-up testing that might help you, but um, 
I am not familiar enough. I, I tried in preparation for this talk to get a better idea of how the data is aligned and, and, and all of that, because I think part of the issue is when you get too low, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know enough about the actual way the data is manipulated to have an idea of, of what the limitations are from that standpoint. Yep. Uh, on the frontier of uh, what's called measurable residual disease. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We belong to something that is a single cell technology, and, and uh, I don't see how this can be kept. Yeah, no, I, I don't necessarily think that that's where its use would be. Um, I suspect that, you know, we might do something similar to what we do now, where you identify abnormalities, you confirm it with fish, and you use fish for follow-up. So is there any other questions? I thought I heard someone else talking when Bharat had started talking. I think we've lost our guest. Okay. It is no, nine Sophia, that, Sophia, that was that was me and oh. Barat asked my question. So Okay. All right. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, thank you everybody for a good discussion today. Um, take care, stay warm, drive safe. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Yohi. Yep. Thanks. Bye.